day everyone! In this video, we will discuss the last topic of Lecture 5, which is complexometric titrations. In Lecture 4, you have already learned the concepts and equilibrium calculations done for complexometric reactions. In this two-part lecture, we will focus on the concepts, calculations, and applications involved in ETA titrations. After this lecture, you must be able to understand the reactions and calculations involved in a Liebig titration to describe the complexometric reactions involved in ETA titrations, predict the effect of pH on metal ETA reactions, and finally perform calculations relating to ETA titration reactions. One of the earliest metal ligand complexometric titration was introduced by Justus Liebig in the 1850s to determine the amount of cyanide present in the solution, and thus the name Liebig titration. Because of its stability and capacity to form a single and easily identified endpoint, it has since become one of the most widely used complexation titration, which involves a unidentate ligand. The Liebig titration technique uses silver as a complexing agent with cyanide forming the silver cyanide complex. The endpoint is marked by the appearance of a permanent turbidity caused by the formation of a precipitate when excess silver reacts with the silver cyanide complex. Now let us solve this problem involving a Liebig titration. Calculate the percent sodium cyanide in a 0.5 gram sample of raw material after the addition of 15.23 ml of 0.0866 molar silver nitrate to reach the equivalence point. Just like in any titration problems that you have already encountered, the important thing to do first is to define the givens and, if you're doing molar-based calculations, establish the balanced chemical equation. Since it is already mentioned that it is a Liebig titration, you must know that it is a reaction of, of silver and cyanide to form the silver cyanide complex. Now, to get percent sodium cyanide, we must first calculate the mass of sodium cyanide that reacted with the moles of titrant that was used. So, calculate the moles of silver nitrate from the given volume and molarity then multiply that with the correct stoichiometric ratio based on the chemical reaction, and finally, multiply by the molecular weight of sodium cyanide to get 129.307 mg of sodium cyanide. The percent sodium cyanide is obtained by dividing the calculated mass of sodium cyanide with the given mass of the sample and multiplying it by 100%. Do not forget to express both parameters in the same units, and thus we get 25.86% sodium cyanide. We now move our discussion to multidentate ligands. In complexometric titrations, it is preferred to use tetra or hexadentate ligands because they react more completely and form more stable complexes with metals. They provide sharper endpoints, which is mainly due to its capacity to form one to one complexes with metals in a single step process. To further illustrate this, refer to the given graph on the right. This compares the titration curves of complexometric reactions using a unidentate, bidentate, and a tetradentate ligand. Say we have a metal with a coordination number of 4 meaning it can form four metal ligand bonds. A tetradentate ligand can bond with a metal in a one-step, one-is-to-one reaction. Curve A shows a very steep curve which easily marks the equivalence point of the reaction. As you have learned in Lecture 4, uni- and bidentate ligands tend to bind with metals in a stepwise manner. If you use a bidentate ligand, you will need two ligands to fill the four bonds with the metal. Thus, a two-step reaction in a 2 is to 1 ratio will take place. Similarly, if you use a unidentate ligand, a four-step reaction happens with a 4 is to 1 ratio. If you observe the given plot, the equivalence point becomes less distinct for uni and bidentate ligands as given in curves C and B, respectively. The use of multidentate aminocarboxylic acids was first introduced in 1945. 
The most widely used complexometric titrant is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid or simply ETA. It is a hexadentate ligand which can donate six pairs of electrodes to a metal ion from the four carboxyl and two amino groups. When ETA is used as a complexing agent, its fully deprotonated form, which is Y4 minus, binds with the metal in a cage like structure as shown in the figure. The reaction of ETA and the metal ion always forms a 1 is to 1 complex product, regardless of the metal ion charge. The fully protonated ETA is a hexaprotic weak acid with six successive pKa values for every H plus ion it releases. Its fully protonated form is H6Y with a charge of positive 2. It can easily remove the two hydrogens given their low pKa values to form the neutrally charged species H4Y. As mentioned in the previous slide, the fully deprotonated form of ETA, Y4-, forms a 1 is to 1 ratio with most of the metal ions in solution regardless of the cation charge. However, if you look at the pKa values, the fully deprotonated form needs at least a pH of about 10 to get a significant concentration of this form. Shown here is a graph of fractional composition of each ETA species with respect to pH. At lower pH, the neutral form H4Y is dominant and as the pH is increased, ETA, ETA gets more deprotonated. At around pH 12, the desired deprotonated form is dominant in solution. However, this is not a practical pH condition for titration as this is more difficult to handle and some metals tend to form metal hydro hydroxides in alkaline solution. Thus, it is preferred to choose a lower pH value which still contains a considerable amount of Y4 species. The fractional composition of the Y4- species or alpha Y4 is calculated by dividing the concentration of the Y4- species by the sum of concentrations of all the uncomplexed ETA species present in the solution, or simply the total ETA concentration. You may find established values of alpha in reference books according to the pH used. You may observe in the given table that in acidic conditions, the desired Y4- form is in a negligible amount, which is not very practical to use. Thus, ETA titrations are usually performed at alkaline conditions. You are already familiar with writing equilibrium constant expressions for complexometric reactions. For a metal ion reacting with the protonated ETA and forming the metal ETA complex, the equilibrium expression is given as such. Shown in this table are the equilibrium constants of different metals with ETA, which is very useful in determining the stability of the metal ETA complex. Recall that higher K values indicate more stable products. However, this equilibrium constant expression assumes that all of ETA is present as Y4-. But that is not usually the case, especially if the pH used is lower than 12, wherein ETA is also present in other forms. Thus, the fractional amount of the Y4- should be taken into account in the calculation of the equilibrium constant. From the previous slide, alpha is calculated using this equation. Solving for the concentration of Y4-, we get this. Then, we substitute this equation to the equilibrium constant expression. If we transpose the alpha variable to the other side, we get an equation for the conditional formation constant, which is k prime is equal to alpha times the original formation constant k. This conditional formation constant gives a more quantitative information about the complex formation at a given pH. Take note, however, that this k prime value is only valid at the pH where the alpha value used is applicable. In acidic conditions, Complex products are usually unstable, which is, which is signified by the very small alpha values resulting to small k prime values as well. Thus, it is important to know the minimum pH values that could be used with certain metal ETA reactions that would still make the titration successful. This graph was established by choosing an arbitrary k prime value of 10 to the 6 
which is sufficient for a successful and quantitative titration. This is a very important tool to know at what pH must the metal eta reaction be done and maintained for it to be effective. For example, you want to determine cobalt. A pH of at least 5.8 must be buffered to ensure a quantitative reaction between cobalt and eta. To check your understanding, let us consider this problem. Calculate the molar Y4- concentration in a 0.02 molar eta solution buffered to a pH of 10. At pH 10, alpha is 0.35. Since there is no reaction that happened, we can assume that the total uncomplexed eta concentration CT is just equal to its initial concentration of 0.02 molar. To get the molar concentration of Y4, we use the equation of alpha. Substituting known values, we get 7 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. For the next problem, calculate the concentration of nickel in a solution that was prepared by mixing 50 ml of 0.03 molar nickel with 50 ml of 0.05 molar eta. The mixture was buffered to a pH of 3. The chemical reaction and the equilibrium constant are also given. So first, calculate the concentration of nickel eta complex formed in the reaction by multiplying the concentration of nickel which is 0.03 molar and its volume of 50 ml then divided by the total volume of 100 ml to get 0.015 molar next calculate the concentration of uncomplexed eta by getting the difference of the initial eta concentration and the amount of eta used to react with nickel the initial concentration is calculated as such. The amount of eta reacted is just equal to the concentration of nickel eta complex since the, re the ratio is just 1 is to 1. So we will obtain 0.01 molar. Then, calculate the conditional formation constant by multiplying the given alpha and k values with to get 1.05 times 10 to the 8th. The concentration of nickel is obtained from the equation of the conditional formation constant K prime. Isolating nickel 2 plus and substituting the already known values, we get nickel concentration equal to 1.38 times 10 to the negative 8 molar. Next, we move on to establishing titration curves. This is done by plotting the p-value of the metal concentration against the volume of eta that was added. This is very similar to other titration curves that have already been discussed in the previous lectures. A well-designed EDTA titration experiment will result to a titration curve with a sharp endpoint. The three regions, which are the pre-equivalence, equivalence, and post-equivalence regions, are also apparent in EDTA titration curves. In the pre-equivalence region, the metal ion is still in excess and the EDTA is fully consumed. Once equivalence point is reached, the metal ions are in equal concentration as the eta in the solution. However, this concentration is small since at the equivalence point, the reaction is marked to be complete and almost all of the metal ions have reacted with almost all of the eta that was added. Adding, ad adding more eta will make the eta concentration in excess and marks the post-equivalence region. At this point, very small concentration of the free metal may still exist, but virtually all are already complexed with the eta. As I have already mentioned, pH is a very important factor in eta titration since it dictates the species of eta present in the solution and the stability of the complex products that, were, that are formed. Shown in this graph is the effect of pH on the titration curve of calcium titrated with EDTA. This shows that as the pH decreases, the equivalence region gets less distinct because the reaction is incomplete. If you refer to the graph of minimum pH requirement for different metals in slide 14, you will see that complexation with calcium needs, to, needs at least a pH of about 8 to get a quantitative titration. Again, it is important to choose a pH that will give you an easily identifiable endpoint for the titration to be deemed successful. 
In this graph, you will see the titration curves of different metals with EDTA at pH 6. At constant pH, it is best to look at the formation constant values of different metals to see which will form stable products at the specified pH. A useful table was shown in slide 12. Generally, larger K values form more stable complex products and thus gives sharper endpoints. For titration curve calculations, let us consider this problem. Calculate the PCA during the titration of 50 ml of 0.005 molar calcium with 0.01 molar EDTA in a solution that is buffered at a pH of 10. After the addition of 5, 25, and 26 ml of the titrant. To get the PCA values, the calcium concentrations in the given three regions must be calculated first. To do this, first, Calculate the conditional formation constant since this is very important in calculating the metal concentration in each region. Since the alpha and equilibrium constants are already given, we can get K prime equals 1.75 times 10 to the 10. At pre-equivalence point, remember that virtually all of EDTA gets consumed and the metal ion is in excess. The remaining calcium concentration is obtained by subtracting the amount of calcium that reacted with the EDTA from the initial calcium concentration and dividing it by the total volume. Substituting known values, we get 3.636 times 10 to the negative 3 molar calcium. The PCA is calculated by getting the negative log of the calcium concentration. We get here 2.439. At the equivalence point, we assume that almost all of the calcium is already converted to calcium EDTA complex and a very small amount is left. So first, calculate the concentration of the metal complex formed by dividing the moles of calcium with the total volume of the solution now at 75 ml. We get here 3.333 times 10 to the negative 3 molar calcium EDTA complex. Note that at the equivalence point, the amounts of the free metal ion and EDTA are equal. We can use that information in the K' expression to get the concentration of calcium 2 plus. Isolating the calcium 2 plus concentration and substituting known values, we get 4.364 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. Getting the negative logarithm of this value, we get a PCA value of 6.36. Finally, at the post-equivalence region, a much lower concentration of free calcium is present and EDTA is already in excess. First, Calculate for the concentration of the calcium EDTA complex using the total volume of 76 ml. Then, solve for the excess EDTA concentration by getting the difference of the initial EDTA in the solution and the amount of EDTA used to form the metal complex. So we get here 1.321 times 10 to the negative 4 molar EDTA. Using the K' expression, we can isolate the calcium the calcium concentration and substitute the known values to get 1.423 times 10 to the negative 9 molar. And then finally, solving for the PCA using negative logarithm, we get 8.85. Now, if we do these calculations to more points in each region, we can establish the titration curve for a given metal EDTA system. Now, for the last part of this lecture, Let's discuss what indicators are used in complexometric titrations. The most commonly used indicators for complexometric titrations are organic dyes called metallochromic indicators, which changes colors as they bind to metal ions in solution. The complex formed by the metal and indicator must be less stable than the metal EDTA complex because otherwise, the EDTA won't be able to react with the metal and the metal will just stay bonded with the indicator. As seen in the given table, the effectiveness of the indicators is also dependent on pH. Therefore, the chosen indicator must also be applicable to the pH condition required by the metal-edta reaction. 
Most complexometric indicators are also polyprotic and usually exhibit different colors depending on the dominant species in the solution. For example, let us consider the indicator that we used in experiment 5, which is aerochrome black tea or EBT. The color of EBT could be red, blue, or orange in solution depending on the dominant species existing, which depends on the solution pH. Since the color of the metal EBT complex is red-violet, it would be very hard to see an endpoint that changes from red-violet to red. Thus, it is preferred to buffer the solution at a pH slightly above 7 so that once all the metal ions have complexed with EDTA, the solution will change from red-violet to blue, signaling the endpoint. Again, when choosing the pH of the solution, make sure that the working pH is favorable for both the metal eta reaction and the indicator. This ends the first part of Lecture 5D. Thank you for listening and see you in our synchronous discussion.